you for staying and for those of you who have just arrived, we are just about to begin. We'll have this as our 30 second warning. Thank you. I call to order our January 15th, 2015 regular town council meeting. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance followed by the invocation. As noted on the agenda, the invocation may be offered by a person of any religion, faith, belief, or non-belief, as well as council members. A list of volunteers is maintained by the town clerk. An interested person should contact the clerk for further information. For the pledge, Councilmember Daniels has invited the scouts up front, and why don't, you, let me just pass it to you and you can introduce who will say the pledge. Thank you, Mayor. We have Cade from Troop 280 who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We invite those in council chambers to please arise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. you may be seated. Mayor, we have a great group of scouts here tonight. We'll have each of them introduce themselves, give them a rank, and pass the mic. And I will give them our traditional copy of the Constitution for them to use in their studies as they move forward. So, Cade, we'll start with you. My name is Cade Allison, and I'm a Life Scout. My name is Maverick Grip, and I'm Tenderfoot. My name is Mark Chavez, and I'm Tenderfoot. My name is Jaden, and I'm Tenderfoot. My name is Ian Allison, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name is Ben Josses, I'm Tenderfoot. My name is Jaden Schneider, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name is Leah Marr, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name is Luke Wyvern, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name is Bryce Richardson, and I'm a Life Scout. My name is Sam Antonelli, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name is Carter Cho, and I am a Tenderfoot. My name is Vincent Kwan, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name is Wyatt Williams, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name is Wesley Wilford, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name's Jackson Freestone, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name is Brian Burby, and I'm a Scout. My name is Logan Brewer, and I'm a Tenderfoot. My name is Dallin Turner, and I'm second class. My name is Nicholas Hill, and I'm second class. My name is Robert Gibson. I am an Eagle Scout and, and one of the Scout Masters for this brood from the middle over. My name is Tim Hill, second Xanax. Just kidding, uh, Eagle Scout. Thank you, a nice round of applause for our Scouts tonight. Thank you. Very, with the veteran scouts that were also introduced, very exciting to hear how many Tenderfoot scouts are here. And we welcome you and thank you for coming. We invite Father John from St. Timothy's Catholic Church to come forward and offer the invocation. Father John. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this evening, for this council, for the mayor, for the new vice mayor. We pray that you send your spirit upon us, spirit of knowledge, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, and especially a spirit of right judgment as this council serves the public trust, keeping always in mind the welfare of the citizens of this township. We pray that you guide and guard them as they conduct the business they will conduct tonight. And we pray all this in your name, amen. Thank you, Father John. 
Our deputy clerk will now conduct the roll call. Mayor John Lewis. Here. Vice Mayor Jordan Ray. Here. Council Member Eddie Cook. Here. Council Member Jen Daniels. Here. Council Member Victor Peterson. Here. Council Member Bridget Peterson. Here. Council Member Taylor. Here. A quorum is present. Thank you. Those of you who were here the last hour, you saw a very special event, and so we welcome you to the f council meeting, first one of the year 2015, where we also have a new council. And to council member Bridget Peterson, welcome. And to four members of the council who were part of the oath of office just in the last hour, we thank you too for your service. Before we go to agenda item number one, we have a couple of quick slides, and Kurt, if you could come forward, and two or three events that will be taking place in the community. And so the first one on the Bluegrass Bash, if you could get that slide up, is that possible? The local Lions Club has organized a very special event. This is the, I, I think, fourth annual, and it is at Gilbert High School this Saturday night. You're invited to support them in their efforts as they are providing service from all of the uh, proceeds. And the Bluegrass Bash uh, has two groups that will be presenting, and the mayor is the MC. And I am excited for that opportunity. The next slide is Monday, we join a regional Martin Luther King parade and invite our Gilbert residents to join us at 11 a.m. Uh, next Monday in downtown Mesa will be the Martin Luther King uh, Parade. Uh, the theme is Many Faces, One Community. And then in our local Gilbert community, we've had many events already, and one that will continue is an, a photo exhibition of three civil rights marches that took place, and we are inviting our community to especially uh, come, and in a few minutes you will see some of the winners of our art competition. They will also be recognized next Wednesday at the art intersection from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, the program in that uh, two-hour time period will take place at 5 p.m. Our Human Relations Commission will also be uh, participating in that, and so you are invited to come next Wednesday to the art intersection. Those are the announcements that I took from the end of the meeting to the front, and I thank you for that. And now, Councilmember Cook will proceed with agenda item number one. Thank you, Mayor. Could I have Dr. Greg Allen and his team and family please come forward? And if I could also have our Team Gilbert staff that help this out, please come forward too. Come on up. Well, Greg, I'm going to turn the mic over to you, and maybe you can share a little bit about this wonderful inaugural marathon that we had back in November. Thank you. Thank you, council members. Um, I am excited and thankful to the city of Gilbert for allowing us to bring uh, uh, a Gilbert marathon um, where we're able to um, provide a great service to those that like to run and exercise. To the city of Gilbert, we were able to see some of the beautiful sights and run through the town. We had amazing support from the whole city of Gilbert. And then the exciting news, the whole purpose of this is to help build shade structures uh, in the parks and elementary schools and to protect our kids for skin cancer. Oh, I have my wonderful family, uh, my boss here of all, my wife Tara, uh, my son Colton, my daughter Sammy, um, this is Kate and Macy, and the rest of my team um, did not make it. And did they? I've got Team Gilbert. I mean, we had the police, we had everybody. We had the best team, and um, we had wonderful support. It's been amazing. Well, we want to thank Greg and his team because what we're here to to do is that we have a, cert a certificate of appreciation to thank you and your team for having this inaugural marathon run in Gilbert, and we look forward to 
other marathons in the future. So with that, can we have a round of applause? Agenda item number two, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's my pleasure to recognize uh, a number of things relative to uh, the weekend here celebrating uh, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. I w I w I'd like to start by inviting some members of our Human Relations Commission up here. I see three here. Ellie, Sydney, Jason, come on up. Can join me here, please. I'm going to introduce you, and then I'm going to help put you to work here to help me recognize some of these great young people. Yeah, Ellie, bring your assistant there. Mayor, can we appoint her for a moment to be part of the extended Human Relations Commission? <laughs> Ellie Harper serves as the chair of our Human Relations Commission, and then two commissioners here, Cindy McKinnon, McKinnon and uh, Jason C. Van Carr, and we're so glad that they serve, and the volunteers in our community are so valuable. And uh, it's our pleasure tonight to recognize a number of young people who participated in the art contest. And you may have seen some of the, the wonderful art in the lobby. And so I'd like to invite the following individuals up um, from Division A grades K through six, uh, Riley Bingham from Burke Elementary. Come on up here, Riley. We're gonna have you stand right here. And Maisie Kirby and Kendall Kalbeck. If you could come up here. Maisie is from Canyon Rim Elementary and uh, Kendall Kalbeck is from Coronado Elementary. Okay, excellent. So here's what I'd like to do. As I read their names and the place, maybe uh, one, two, or three, two, one, Ellie. And if you can go to the mayor, he'll give you the award here. So, from Burke Elementary, third place recognition goes to Riley Bingham. Please give her a hand. In second place, from Canyon Rim Elementary, Maisie Kirby. And first place in Division A, K through sixth grades from Coronado Elementary, Kendall Kalbeck. Okay, and we're gonna ask you to stay up here because right at the end, we'll take a picture with all of the award winners, okay? Wonderful, okay. The next division, grades seven and eight, if I could have the following individuals come up. And uh, guess what? They're all from Sossaman Middle School. So they must have a great art teacher there. Maybe she's here tonight. We can Is the art teacher from? OK, why don't you come up with them as well? But I'd like to have Elise Mendez, Paige Kaler, and Stephanie Kim come forward here and join me. And the art teacher. Okay, the Smithsonian is never gonna have a shortage of wonderful art, Mayor. We're, we're, we're gonna be able to stock it full of beautiful art for a long time. Okay, all from Sossaman Middle School. Third place award goes to Elise Mendez. Congratulations. Okay, second place in this category, Paige Kaler.
And then first place, Stephanie Kim. Okay, I know you're trying to hide there. Magical art teacher, tell us your name, please. Um, it's Rachel Koblenz. Rachel, con wonderful. This is congratulations. And we would like to have uh, Jay Co come forward as well. Jay? Where's Jay? Okay, Jay, come on up. Jay's from Highland High School. And we're, we're lucky to have you here tonight. Jay gets the Best of Show Award, so could you please give him a big round of applause? <laughs> Mayor, do you have anything to say to these wonderful artists and their recognition for our civil rights and Dr. Martin Luther King this weekend? It is just some additional appreciation. I had a chance to look at the art, and we thank you for it. If you're able to join us next Wednesday at the Art Gallery, or at the Art uh, Intersection, we'll recognize you again, but on behalf of all of our Gilbert residents, thank you for sharing your talent. We appreciate it. Thank you. And for those who may not be here at Town Hall to see the art, um, it'll be here for a couple of days, and then it's gonna go on a little road show. It's gonna be at Art Intersection to join uh, the art that's currently there, and then it will be at the Gilbert uh, Library on um, Greenfield and Elliott. But if you could come up here just a little bit for a picture. And since I have the microphone, another big round of applause for all of our winners. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Next on the agenda, communication from citizens. Vice Mayor Ray, do we have any requests tonight? We do not. Okay. I'm just looking across council chambers to confirm. We will now move to the consent calendar. Vice Mayor Ray, do we have any requests from the council? We do not. I'm ready for a motion, if you okay. are, Mayor. I will entertain a motion. I move that we approve item four, item five A, B, and C, item six A, B, and C, Item seven, item eight, item nine, item 10, A and B, item 11, item 12, A and B, with the changes noted today, item 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, A and B, and also item 18. Thank you. With that motion, is there a second? Second. With that motion and second, please vote. Those items are approved with a seven of vote, thank you. We move to the public hearing items. And Vice Mayor Ray, before I open any of these items, do we have a uh, request from the council or from the public to speak? We do for item uh, 21, Mayor. Okay, thank you. 19 and 20, uh, no requests. None okay. There. As noted on the agenda, if you wish to speak on a public hearing item, you must fill out a public comment form indicating the item number. And so we've had some uh, citizens request to, to have 21 uh, uh, be part of open discussion. So I will go ahead and open the public hearing on agenda items 19 and 20. And as Vice Mayor Ray noted, there were no requests to speak on those two items. And so I will close the public hearing on agenda items 19 and 20 and enter entertain a motion. 
Mayor, I move that we approve items 19 and 20. Is there a second? Second. With that motion and second, please vote. Thank you, those items are approved with a seven of vote, thank you. I now open agenda, I'll open the public hearing on agenda item number 21, and we'll turn to town staff for a brief overview, please. Thank you, Mayor, members of the town council. Um, appreciating the town council has lots of comments on this item and there's public speakers. We'll try and be as brief as possible. Uh, so very quickly, Z1415C is attempting to deal with uh, guest parking issues we have in compact single family development. Uh, town council actually asked staff to research this issue this summer. We presented at study session in September, gave the town council a very high level update of what we thought the issues were check for the direction we were going. The town council seemed to uh, support the direction. We've since worked with the planning commission, various members of the development community, and uh, tonight we present a, uh, a mitigation for the issue that, that we'll talk about here in a little bit more detail. So essentially, we, ha we have a uh, font, if you will, font, if you will, of, of guest parking complaints, and, and they stem from having not enough parking or where the parking is. It's, it's creating congestion issues. Uh, there's private parking restrictions that have to some degree artificially uh, affected how people are parking or maneuvering within a subdivision. And of course, we know when we have inadequate guest parking, we create some uh, unnecessary risk for our community, uh, among other kind of uh, undesirable effects. So it's important to, to really be proactive about addressing guest parking. So the goal uh, this evening is to really approach this issue with a scalpel. Uh, we, we know that projects coming in today provide adequate guest parking. We don't really s receive complaints from a lot of the projects we've seen lately. So we, we, we go into this thinking there are some localized issues we need to address, and this isn't a, a broad thing uh, to, to overhaul the parking ordinance. Uh, so very quickly, I think we all know what subdivisions look like. Uh, on uh, map left here, where my clicker went, uh, map left here is your uh, conventional single family lot. You can see with a two car driveway, a two car garage, and maybe three spaces available out on the curb. Immediately adjacent to it is maybe maybe a narrower lot, but maybe the same, sign, same kind of conventional lot width, but they're taking their access off of an alley. Uh, when you take your access off an alley with a garage, you're actually not required to provide a full driveway. So when we have alley loaded projects, a lot of times we don't have driveways. Um, and then on the far right here is a compact narrow lot that is providing the garage, is providing the driveway, but you can see intrinsically as the lot width shrinks, you lose curb capacity. Some examples of projects from around town. Uh, you know, you're seeing a six pack here on the bottom of the screen and you can see how guest parking works in a six pack. Typically there'd be two spaces on either row, so you get four spaces to the six pack four guest spaces to six units is a, is a comfortable level. Uh, another project on the top left there, you can see that this project is, is before we started requiring flares at the outside of alleyways today where those dumpsters are now, we actually have designated areas where you put the dumpsters and that's important because those dumpsters, if they're not planned properly, can cut into parking capacity. Again, more examples of projects in the town you can see this large open space track with the single loaded street next to it. Th this is an idea we're trying to get to in all subdivisions, just making sure that we always have some nominal amount of single loaded street near an open space to achieve some, some guest parking specific to the active open space. And certainly we, we don't like at the bottom left here where you're actually signing the open spaces, no parking. <laughs> So those are some examples of projects. The analysis of the land development code itself, you know, turn the mirror on yourself. We have this gap. We have this gap in the zoning ordinance today when it comes to guest parking. If you are providing no on-street parking, so in other words, you come in and, and tell the town you're gonna do a project with no on-street parking, we allow you to narrow your street width because of that. And, and so there's, there's some market, I guess, opportunity for those types of projects, although we don't really see them. But if you don't provide on-street guest parking, although you get the benefit of a narrower street, you're challenged with an off-street guest parking requirement. If you are providing on-street parking, so you're providing us a 33-foot right-of-way, which the town traffic engineer says is enough right-of-way to get parking on both sides of the street, there's no per se ratio. So in other words, the code assumes if you tell us you're providing on-street parking, there's no actual ratio for that parking. That is not a problem if you're doing conventional development and you don't have these different operational conflicts with trash pickup or mail or, or all these other things. Uh, but as you get more compact, the lack 
or the absence of the requirement could present a challenge. Very quickly, a few projects from 10 years ago that for the most part, the projects we were approving 10 years ago are the com complaints, for lack of a better word, that, that we're getting today. This is one of the least parked phases of any of the SF6, SFA, SFD projects that were approved in that time period. And their part, total parking ratio is 3.1 spaces per unit or 1.1 guest spaces per unit. That, that is the far low end of what we found. Uh, much more in line with the, the conventional range that we see, this is Lions Gate, and so basically the red line, I'm just carving out the houses in that you know, sub phase or phase and then adding up the parking. So that phase is at one space per 1.6 dwelling, uh, or excuse me, one unit per 1.6 dwelling unit or parking spaces per dwelling unit. A Little bit higher than the site plan you just saw. We, we have projects that, that go above this, but obviously subdivisions we're getting, have gotten complaints from, you, you would expect a somewhat lower number. So analyzing all of this information, the complaints are definitely localized, okay? So where we get complaints is where we don't have driveways or where we have really narrow lots. That is evident in, in, in the discussions and the stats. The lack of requirements. So we don't actually have a true guest parking ratio for dwelling units if you have on-street parking. And we don't have an active open space requirement, and that's somewhat uncommon. A lot of zoning ordinances have a specific, whether it's three spaces per ball court or whatever it is, have an active open space requirement. And finally, uh, well, not finally, but the, the practical capacity is also a concern in all this. So how are people using garages, and can we regulate that? What's the nexus there? What's the practical capacity of parking if it's so far away from the dwelling unit you can't practically walk to that space? And then striping, we know that uh, requiring striping does increase the practical capacity of parking. And I'll leave for my final bullet point here, the lack of plan review and coordination we have today. This is probably the, the biggest part of this text amendment is now requiring compact single family development to show us a parking plan. So we can start to see where's the parking gonna go? Are you gonna create pinch points? Is it coordinated with where the trash pickup is? These are all things we would do in multifamily, but we don't do it in compact single family today. The two types of product have very similar um, externalities. So the proposed language, and I'll quickly walk through this. So for single family, where you're not providing any, any on-street parking, so you come into it knowing you're gonna do a narrower street and provide off-street parking, we're simply adding an active open space requirement to that. And as you saw in all these aerials, you're not having to change anything. All, all these developments are already providing single loaded streets next to the active open space. We just want something on a parking plan that says, that single loaded street next to where the active open space is will be for parking. Uh, so then we jump into the, the real crux of this. So single family lots less than 65 feet and single family that is without a 20 foot driveway, a full driveway, uh, we get into this kind of wonky plannery. So let me walk you through it. Um, so two enclosed spaces per unit, that's the standard today, plus 0.5 guest parking spaces per unit. So in other words, the the guest parking requirement is now there for these two types of products. 65 feet or less, no driveway, or minimal driveway. Plus 0.5 guest parking spaces per unit that does not provide a minimum 80 square feet of additional enclosed parking area. So if you think about a 20 foot garage, we're talking about adding four feet to the back of it in depth. So 20 feet times four, 80 square feet. That would be the easiest way to get there. If, well, I take that back. The easiest way to get there is to say, we're not gonna do the 80 square feet, we're gonna provide one space per dwelling unit. That's probably the easiest way to get there. And all the developments we've been seeing easily meet the one guest space per dwelling unit, and we'll show that in a second. So now we're at either 0.5 or one, depending on how much garage area you have. And then we say the active open space requirement would also kick in here. So six spaces at your primary, then if you have multiple secondaries or just one secondary, you'd be required to have three spaces at those secondary active open spaces. We say that all required parking must be striped and equally distributed. Parking must be reviewed and approved through a parking plan. And finally, the planning commission was adamant about this, that we have some specified maximum distance that the pedestrian route would be from wherever that front of the lot is to that guest space so that we ensure it's a functional space for that unit. So comparing what staff is proposing to recent projects, so this is a infill small parcel 
SF7 with a PAD that we dropped down to a 55 foot wide lot. Um, I'll give you the, the, the basically, so this development obviously wasn't required to meet the proposed text amendment today. The arrow is pointing at their primary active open space. They have a second, excuse me, the arrow is pointing at the secondary active open space. And then there's another primary active open space towards the northwest end of that map. And you can see the amount of single loaded street. I mean, they, they've quadrupled what staff is proposing for the active open space requirement. And they have plenty of curb parking. So these lots all have at least one space on the curb in front of them. But what's great about this development is they provide a lot of on-lot parking. So even though they trigger the parking plan review with their 55-foot wide lots, you can see they've got every lot has at least two cars available to park on the driveway. Some of them you could probably get three in there. Um, some of these are angled driveways with three garages, so a side entry garage and a standard two-car garage. Uh, so, so this project, again, representative of the types of things we see today, um, easily meets the, the proposed parking requirements. Uh, here's the statistics behind it. They are providing 26 total active open space uh, spaces. We would require nine. They're providing close to four guest spaces for every dwelling unit. We would require one per dwelling unit for this project. This is Cooley Station phases nine and 11. This project is probably the, the poster child for the greatest parking allotment ever. Uh, so they are doing multiple product types within a single phase. They range from four pack to alley loads to a five pack product, which we really don't ever see here in the town. Um, and this project is approaching four total spaces per unit or two guest spaces per dwelling unit. So double what staff is proposing tonight. Double the requirement of what staff is proposing tonight. Their active open space requirement is something like five times what staff is requiring or, or suggesting tonight. Here's just a quick dimension of what 250 looks like at Lionsgate. So the point is this, this lot on the long block that has the hardest parking to get to still can get to 250 at a curb spot. I always like to point out wherever I see the illegal parking, you can see the illegal parallel parked in the alleyway. So again, these aerials are generally taken in the morning at random days during the week. So if there's a demand challenge at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday, we know there's an issue. Uh, so public review of this text amendment, the Planning Commission uh, supported it. There was one dissenting vote, but generally speaking, I think most of the Planning Commission would probably look for more regulation than what staff is recommending, but they understood the, the scalpel approach and, and, and the Planning Commission was very supportive of this. The Chamber of Commerce was very supportive of the text amendment. The Southeast Valley Association of Realtors was very supportive of the text amendment. The Home Builders Association had one or two concerns. So let's walk through that very quickly. So rightly so, the Home Builders were, were first concerned about HOAs are restricting on-street parking. So if I have a project midstream or I'm just coming in and I want to provide on-street parking and I can do the parking plan and easily meet these requirements, are we going to be held up if there's an existing HOA restriction? The answer is no. And a couple of reasons behind that. One, it's a private matter. We're not going to hold up a permit on some private restriction. Two, these parking restrictions tend to be overnight. Um, and technically, we don't have a demand challenge really at 3 in the morning, so we're, we're less concerned there. Um, where we do have the concern is where the HOA has restricted parking on both sides of the street with like a sign or some other barrier that wasn't approved by the town. That does create traffic issues, and we do have that concern, but that isn't necessarily addressed by this text amendment. So to make a long story short, the home builders are satisfied with the knowledge that projects in midstream are just coming in are not going to have to comply with some third party private agreement that may change and is impossible to implement. Uh, we're just showing a, 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 pro, a door trails project that um, th this project is obviously built, but the, the, the home builders pointed to a door trails as having several phases in midstream right now where if we were to ask them to do something different, it, it would affect them. And so we, we are not going to do that. And, and just illustrating a door trails apparently does restrict on street parking. The red dots indicate where there's on street parking in this aerial. So even though the HOA might restrict on street parking, the practical parking situation is what you're seeing here. So people need to work on your house, they're gonna park on the street, you have family, they're gonna park on the street, so it happens either way. You can also see that without knowing about this text amendment, this developer provided more than the six spaces at the active open space on that single loaded street down there. So again, the market is really doing 
above and beyond what we're asking for here. So we're just trying to get the minimum level to protect ourselves is really a good way of looking at this. Clarify when a midstream project would be considered vested or grandfathered. If you have preliminary plat approval or sub substantially invested in infrastructure, you have vested. So if you're at that point, you wouldn't need to redesign anything. The Home Builders Association, are, I believe, are satisfied with that. Clarify that the driveway length trigger of 20 feet means practical 20 feet. So if you have a you know, non-perpendicular driveway and it has a turn or a dog leg or a radius, at some point in there, you're going to have a 20-foot dimension that you can meet. So that's all staff is looking for there, and the Home Builders Association seems satisfied uh, with that. Increase the garage face maximum percentage design guideline to reflect the additional parking capacity requirements or parking requirements and reduce the open space requirement to make up for the now parking that's going to be required at those active open spaces. So um, let's, let's talk about the active open space one first. So we, we've already demonstrated that it's always going to be innately there. They're, they're, it's almost impossible to design open space, active open space, without single loaded streets somewhere near it. So you, that one you're always going to be able to meet. Frankly, 5% active open space is, is the minimum. If you would find in any zoning ordinance, you're not going to find something less than 5% active open space. So we're hesitant to change that. We did some research on the 40%. And here's my read on it. Low density single family, up to four dwelling units per acre, has the design guideline in place for the 40% elevation. And then we have a series of projects where we've allowed beyond 40% because they've recessed the third face of the garage or there's columns. So there's some flexibility to the low density projects up to four dwelling units. They have this 40% requirement, but there has been some flexibility interpreting this over time. The projects we're talking about really are always going to exceed four dwelling units per acre, that high to you know, medium to high density single family. That's what we're talking about, compact development in SF6, SFA, SFD. The only treatment of garage face in the design guidelines for medium to high density is this graphic. And I realize it's tough to see, but you're seeing two lots. 81 feet is the total width of both lots. And you can see the garage represents at least half of each lot. So basically what this graphic is saying is it's, in, it's encouraged to have 50% so long as you're staggering or providing, other, you know, in other words, the, the code assumes that as you get denser, you're going to have to have a 50% garage face relative to your front plane. Uh, that's in the code today. It's not real clear. To be honest, you know, the, the design guidelines aren't that clear, and maybe that's a future text amendment we can look at. But the land development code currently does not require 40% for low density single family. I just want to be totally clear on that point. Uh, so as far as modifying the 40% for the projects we're talking about, the point is we don't need to because there isn't a 40% requirement. The home builders have pointed out that there could be aesthetic issues with always requiring striping for the required spaces. Staff, you know, sees that concern and so we're proposed tonight to address that concern with some additional language that the home builders association has, has expressed support for. So essentially, your parking spaces must be striped and equally distributed throughout the development as approved on the parking plan. So that would give staff some flexibility to not require striping in certain places. Just to give you a visual of what striping looks like in a single family situation, this is it. I mean, it's, it's not terribly ugly, but certainly you could see where maybe you wouldn't want the striping in front of every house. Again, this is a kind of a partial striping job and it just delineates the travel lane from those parallel spaces that, that minor paint on the asphalt it makes a huge difference in the practical capacity finally the home builders have suggested that the intent here I think there's some recognition that there's probably more cushion if you make the trigger 65 feet but the home builders have been able to show where even at 55 and above your lot width with a full driveway you, you would be able to get a, a full parking space in most cases on that curb and for that reason, staff is comfortable taking it down to, to 55 as being suggested by the home builders tonight. Uh, and, and I'll let the um, representative from the home builders speak more to this. But in short, and probably not so short, but in short, the, the recommendation this evening is what Planning Commission recommended with two slight changes based on the, the great feedback we've gotten from the home builders, and that is give us some flexibility on where the striping is required and knock down the trigger to 55 feet. That is the text you see in front of you. Staff is comfortable with this text. And finally, uh, want to staff 
or staff would like to thank the Home Builders Association, the Chamber of Commerce, Southeast Valley Realtors, and of course the Town Council for uh, having staff look into this issue. And we feel it, it, it was a serious issue after the research and, and we're happy to discuss the text amendment more. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Vice Mayor Ray, do we have request to speak on this topic? Mayor, we have five requests, three of which wish to speak and two just wish to have their name on record. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's proceed, please. So the two who uh, have requested not to speak, um, one is Kathy Tilkey, who is in favor of this item. The other is Camilla Alarcon, Al 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 I believe. Uh, available if necessary, but wishes not to speak, although she is for this as well. Then the three who would like to speak, uh, Matt Ortega, Joan Kruger, and Jackson Mole. Thank you. And sometimes we do two minutes, sometimes three minutes. Uh, any recommendations? I think two minutes would be. All right. Let's go for the two-minute time period. Please continue. So we'll, we'll start with Matt Ortega and then Joan Kruger and lastly Jackson Mole. Mayor Lewis, members of the council. Again, my name is Matthew Ortega for the record. I am the director of government affairs for the Southeast Valley Regional Association of Realtors or SEVRAR, as many of you know. Our board of directors has voted in support of this amendment to the land development code, Z1415C. And we uh, very much appreciate uh, town staff, Jordan's been very engaging with, with us in terms of uh, us being a stakeholder, and we appreciate your leadership in moving something forward that not only addresses a current problem, but is prospective in terms of trying to provide a strong quality of life for the citizens of, of Gilbert. And uh, Mayor, if I may be non-germane just for a moment, I had spoken with our president, Heidi Quigley-Lark, this evening, and. She sends her congratulations once again to Councilman Peterson and Cook and Councilwoman Peterson, as well as Vice Mayor Jordan. And we thank you again for this opportunity to work with the council. Thank you. Thank you. Joan Kruger. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I appreciate you letting me speak this morning. Joan Kruger, I am a member of this fine community, Gilbert, and I also am here to represent Sevrar as the chair of their government affairs committee. And as you know, we are very pleased to be working with the communities in our membership to improve the marketability of, of real estate. And we believe that Jordan has done a great job. We appreciate your time, his time, and uh, we support this and believe that the approval of this this item will benefit the realtors. So thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you. And Jackson Mole is the last one. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. My name is Jackson Mall. I'm the Vice President of Municipal Affairs for the Home Builders Association of Central Arizona. Um, first and foremost, I, I, I have to thank staff for all the hard work that they put into this and in working with the association and trying to address the concerns that we raised. Um, and then I'd also like to thank the council for uh, working with us and, and each of the council members that I was able to speak with for your input and uh, responsiveness to some of the concerns that we've addressed. Um, basically, the concerns that we had fell into, I would say, three broad categories. The first was some of the issues that Jordan addressed related to existing projects and whether this was with the uh, CCNR issue or grandfathering in existing projects that were in various stages of development. Um, and we are comfortable that those issues have been addressed. Um, the second would be what I would call some of the practical implementation issues, such as the driveway length or the striping requirements. We are also comfortable that those uh, concerns have adequately been addressed. Um, the final issue basically relates to um, trying to, as much as possible, narrowly tailor the solution that the town comes up with to where those problem areas are. And this basically uh, focused our attention then on the trigger related to lot width. Um, the Home Builders Association uh, put forth a 50 foot lot width as the trigger um, because that's really the point in time at which uh, the builders themselves will start to consider some of these non-conventional um, 
high density compact developments. Um, staff has indicated in the presentation that they are comfortable at the 55 foot trigger point, which the Home Builders Association is willing to support, um, but we would like to ask that staff work with us over the course of the next month or so to look at the garage door issue that we've talked about. And how this relates to parking is that one of the reasons why um, people are reluctant to use their garages for parking is, and Mayor, I apologize for going over. If I could have just a few minutes. Let's give you another 30 seconds, please. Okay, that'd be fine. Um, it is the inability to navigate in and out of their garage doors with, with the, uh, uh, um, storage and so forth that they often use for their garage doors. Not to mention the fact that consumers uh, ask for these types of products. Um, staff, according to the presentation, has indicated that there's not necessarily any types of regulations that the town has put in place which is prohibiting this, but I would like to work with staff and I would like to ask the council to ask staff to work with us to do one of two things. One is either clarify how that's written in the design guidelines so that my members are assured that if they come to the to the town with a product that has say 50% that that will in fact be approved or if there are some types of restrictions that we do have some additional flexibility allowed in there. With those uh, suggested amendments to this text amendment and that recommendation from the council, we are in fact in support of this text amendment. So thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Ray, any other requests? No. Thank you. Councilmember Daniels, as the liaison to the Planning Commission, do you feel comfortable with asking staff to, well, we move forward, but asking staff to look at that or please jump in? Yes, yes, Mayor, I definitely think that that's um, something that we can continue to look at. I would like to echo the comments that many have already made. Our staff has been incredible, and I have heard that from multiple sources at this point uh, in relation to this item. So we very much appreciate the professionalism that you always exhibit, and, and uh, it's, it's uh, a great representation of the town and of your peers here. I. I'm fine looking into those additional things that Jackson has, has indicated tonight, and uh, I hope that we would. But I also want us as a community, if I can add one thing to that list, and that is that we continue to monitor the effect that this ordinance has on parking. I um, share some of the sentiments that were expressed at Planning Commission that I do wonder if this goes far enough, particularly in certain areas of our community that are going to be designed, if you will, not necessarily for student housing, but where students will, uh, by nature of proximity to ASU East and ASU um, Chandler Gilbert Community College, we will see more students living in some of our housing that isn't necessarily, again, designated as student housing, but very much will be utilized for that. And so I would like to see us continue to monitor this and make sure that we're cognizant of not just what the rule is or the ordinance says, but also the implications of that depending on the user. In no way do we want to limit, uh, limit the quantity of cars that people can use. We don't want to... Um, uh, stick our hands in HOA, CCNRs, and things like that. Those are, again, as Jordan pointed out, private matters. But we do, and I've said this before, but the town of Gilbert will only be as strong as the neighborhoods that we have here. And if we, uh, in some way, through ordinance, um, stifle that type of community that will make Gilbert great long into the future, then uh, we, we of course have a heavy responsibility when it comes to that. So again, adding to Jackson's list that we monitor how these ordinances will affect some of our future developments and maybe do some sort of analysis six months, a year from now, where we can identify uh, if in certain areas of town, the gateway character area, for instance, if this really does go far enough. Thank you. Any other council members wish to make comments? Council Mem Member Peterson. I had a question on the um, clarification, and I do think it's warranted. And, and thank you, staff, for you know offering the idea that, that that could be done as part of maybe a future text amendment. Um, can you give us a sense of what would be a reasonable time frame? I always like to have time frames on everything we decide because Without a date, things have a way of kind of slipping away and being unattended. So can you give us some feedback on that? Sure. Uh, Mayor, Councilman, appreciate uh, the clarifying question. I think staff's intent with the Home Builders Association is to uh, 
quickly, I guess, scope the issues in front of us and return to town council within a few weeks, uh, you know, a month at the most, to report on again, here's what our initial discussion is and here's where the direction ought to go and check in and then go from there as to whether or not that would be a, another text amendment that would come out of that or a policy statement or, or something else. Uh, but I think we should probably work on trying to scope something very quickly, bring it back and discuss it with the town council and then go from there. So I would interpret that as maybe a month from now? Mayor, and I'm comfortable if we give as part of the motion something like within the next couple of months just to give some flexibility based on home uh, council meeting dates since Thank they're you. only every two weeks. Okay. Any other comments? Council Member Cook. Jordan, one of the <clears throat> questions when I left your office <clears throat> that I didn't ask was in the parking plan idea, is this a best practice with other communities that provides this option? A great question, Councilman. Um, so other communities have a parking plan, not many, other communities have a parking plan provision for compact single family. Um, and generally in other communities, there's a specific definition to that, like um, a triplex. So the, their code still considers triplex single family but the code recognizes it has the same characteristics as multifamily. So all the other jurisdictions require the parking plan with multifamily, or almost all of the other jurisdictions do. Some of them recognize that there are these kind of tweener projects, and, and they do. But the vast majority, no, this is a, uh, a borrowed innovation, if you will. Uh, and, and so part of the, is this gonna work? And uh, frankly, staff feels like the, the, the reason we can approach this with a scalpel is the parking plan so that we can, you know, on the fly, make some adjustments so we don't get the pinch points, so we put the parking in the right place. Uh, so part of this, as Councilwoman Daniels has pointed out, is very much monitoring how this works over time. But the parking plan absolutely gives us a document that shows where the parking is. It gives the HOA document to show where the required parking went and where you could move it. So it's a great tool for not only ensuring some level of quality in our projects that we might not always guarantee that we will be able to now, but it becomes a tool that everyone can use to have intelligent conversations about parking after the developer is gone, after a life cycle of that subdivision, and maybe the parking demand is, is changed in that subdivision. Well, thank you. Thank you. With that, looking right and left, I close the public hearing on agenda item 21 and we'll entertain a motion. Council Member Daniels. Thank you, Mayor. I move that we approve agenda item 21, zoning Z14-15-C, with the amendments indicated um, by staff and with the three uh, additional items for us to both continue to monitor and to report back within the next 60 days. Second. With that motion and second. Mayor. Oh, please. I'm just gonna try one, one last tweak. If it fails, it does, but I, I move that to amend the motion to change the width from 55 feet to 50 feet. I think that's the right width, personally. Okay, is there a, a second on? Mayor, can I ask a question? On, Please. Uh, Mayor, uh, the question's for Council Member Peterson. I, I, wasn't that the intent of the discussion is to do some analysis on that to see if no, the, the further discussion is a monitoring direction from Council Member Daniels and clarification on the maximum of the front plane of the home that can be garage door that faces the street. Does that help? Okay, so, got it, thank you. Okay, was there a second? Yeah. Mayor, I'll second that. Okay, all right, any other discussion on that? I, I, I would love to ask a question with Jackson because you're the one that brought up the 50 feet. Just to clarify, it sounds like 55 feet is acceptable to your members and that 50 feet is really not something that you may be wanting to die in a sword here on? Uh, Mayor Lewis, uh, Councilman Cook, the 50 feet was the uh, original proposal from the Home Builders Association that was derived from the point uh, at which builders will start to consider laying out their subdivisions in um, the 
uh, non-conventional non high-density compact developments that have perpetuated some of these parking issues. Um, in our discussions with staff, we have agreed that we would be willing to support the 55 feet with the additional look at um, uh, the park or the garage door issue, excuse me, that, uh, uh, that, that we're gonna come back to the council on. So that, that's the agreement that we've met and that's, that's what we're supporting. All right, thank you. Thank you. So to the council, we will first be voting on the amendment to the motion. And we've had a motion and second, so please vote. All right, that is not approved. And so let's return to the original motion. And that also had a second, so please vote on that. And that's approved with a 6-1 vote, thank you. We move to agenda item 22. Boards, commission, and committee updates. I'll turn to the council for any comments that any of you would like to make. Okay, future meetings, any comments? Next, report from the town manager on current events. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. I'd like to ask Dana Birchman, our chief digital officer, to come up and talk about a special event we have coming soon. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Dana Birchman, Chief Digital Officer and Communications Director for Gilbert. I'm here this evening to talk to you about our Spark App League, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. Um, we are about to enter into our third annual uh, mobile application development contest, which is a contest where we bring high school students from across the state of Arizona to take our data that we're collecting here in Gilbert and spend a day with us at the ASU Poly campus, learning everything from design to coding, um, all of the process of what it takes to create a good app. And then they go on in their teams for the next eight weeks and work on their development and prototype and then submit them to us where we give awards. This year we're very excited. We have a new partner um, with Google signing on to participate with us and sponsor. And this is really great because when I first met with Google, you know, they wanted to know their area of interest tends to be more about, you know, where, where you know, Tempe, Scottsdale, Phoenix, why would we be interested in Gilbert? How can you get us interested in this program? And you know, we've really been able to show them the value of this program, not just for people in Gilbert from all across the state. Um, and then hopefully, even beyond that, um, if this can become a model nationally. As far as we know, uh, no other contest of this kind exists in the country. So something to be very proud of. Uh, last year, we created an app through the contest for the fire department. This year, we'll be creating an app um, for tourism for Gilbert. So everything from where to dine, where to go, what to do, events going on. So this is going to be really exciting. And I think the kids are going to be um, really interested in this subject. So I want to show you a brief video. I'm just showing you from last year's launch to give you a sense of what the program is like. Um, as you can see, it's very exciting um, contest and program. And one thing we really wanted to reiterate is that the registration is still open. So we have more than 200 students already registered and we probably see that going upwards beyond 300 in the next few weeks. But January 30th is the day, it's a Friday. And so we're looking for representation from high schools all across the state, not even just here in Gilbert. Um, and so we really look forward to, sometimes we have buses of kids come from schools, other times parents bring their kids for the day. So it's really exciting. You can go to sparkappleague.com to register and find out more information about the program. Thank you. Thank you. Dana, before you leave the mic, did you mention what 
the grand prize is this year for this year's winning well, team? Well, we haven't confirmed that yet, so I'm gonna keep that a secret until we have a final confirmation. But there's always great prizes, everything from cash prizes, um, potentially a trip this year. So, but I'm not gonna say that publicly till it's confirmed. <laughs> Maybe to a World Series championship baseball game? I mean, is there something along those lines? It's St. Louis. I yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Possibly. Anything else from the town manager? I opened myself up for that one. Any additional reports from the town council? Okay, we'll ask from the mayor. I have a bucket, and today I had the privilege of attending the Legacy Traditional School and representing the council and reading a book called Have You Filled Your Bucket Today? And at the conclusion, the 100 third graders that I read to asked if I would tell the council hi. So hi, and they, and they ask if I would read a few of their comments that they put in this bucket that I uh, was given. And I said, okay. So here's a few of the quick comments. Um, Thank you for being, for protecting the town of Gilbert. Thank you for keeping Gilbert and the people I in Gilbert safe from harm. I think that you are the best mayor in the entire world. This is, this is a very good self-esteem day for me. Dear mayor, thank you for coming to our outrageous school, and outrageous was spelled O-U-T-R-A-G-E-S. Dear Mayor Lewis, you're great. Dear Mayor Lewis, I love you. And like I said, this is just a great. Um, dear Mayor Lewis and various comments, do you sometimes meet the governor and president of the United States? Uh, if so, and I assume you do, please say hi to the president and governor from me, your citizen Ashton. So on that note, we thank all of our citizens, and especially today those in the third grade for the great support of our community. And with that, I'll just say the greatest mayor in Gilbert right now calls the meeting adjourned. Thank you.